um, the whole issue. The whole issue of some of the questions which I posed this morning. Are you there? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Excellencies. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you loud and clear. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And my apology for this technical uh, issues. I uh, I couldn't join before that. Like I, I joined and then some subsequently uh, I, I was disconnected. And then so I missed your question. And okay. also like uh, my apology again for this thing. If you uh, if you kindly uh, reiterate your question, then I'll Sure. So uh, essentially, I, I want you to perhaps, um, you know, priority, there's been a lot of support and priorities in response to MSMEs, you know? Yeah. Uh, both to the formal and the in, in, informal ones. But we want to know, first of all, if these policies are working. All governments all over the world have offered interventions, whether it's in the form of tax relief or grants or whatever. But are they working? Are they reaching those? entities that they really ought to reach, particularly the informal ones. We recognize that in this region, there's a large informal sector. So yes. are they, you know, the informal sector, even the formal ones? Okay, and if it's not reaching them, what can be done to reach the informal ones and the more formal ones, perhaps even at the regional level? So maybe we can start with that kind of discussion from, from your side. Okay, perfect. Thank you. First of all, uh, thank you very much and uh, 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 giving me this opportunity to the both uh, organizer uh, uh, and all the co-sponsors. Uh, actually, uh, as you know that uh, that SARC, I would be speaking uh, on behalf of the SARC. Like SARC is 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 uh, one third of like you know uh, that our. Uh, uh, the host of a uh, quarter of humanity and one third of the global poor, and then uh, and then if you see uh, the 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 contribution on in employment of uh, MSME in South Asia is thirty percent of total uh, employment, uh, and forty plus forty seven percent as per the latest data, so is the is. Uh, Forty-seven percent is the contribution on GDP. So, therefore, while the contribution in GDP is less, the enormously uh, large number of uh, employment is on uh, the a a MSME sector, uh, which is even lower than the, the East Asian countries, which would be around sixty percent and fifty around uh, fifty-five percent, respectively. Uh, uh, so. A, 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 Invariably, during this, uh, this uh, after this, during and the pandemic, uh, uh, I I'm saying uh, and during because pandemic is still uh, to be over. Uh, their uh, uh, governments have uh, invariably taken a lot of measures. Uh, in fact, as SARC as a as a whole, uh, I mean, with the initiative of uh, uh, taken by the Honorable Prime Minister of India. Uh, there was a the the SARC leaders summit a video conference was organized as early as September 2000 uh, March 2020 itself and there was an immediately emergency voluntary fund of 21 million uh, US dollar was was done and subsequently number of uh, meetings are also also organized uh, the finance ministers of SARC. Uh, uh, have met uh, twice on these pandemic uh, issues, like in 2020 and also in 2021 uh, in May. And the ministers have uh, clearly delineated and described the various kind of uh, measures they have taken uh, to, to, to uh, deal with uh, the situation and the, uh, particularly MSME. There are a lot, a large number of uh, measures have been taken. Now, what kind of supports were expected by MSMEs? So that's studies and other uh, these things that that had, has found that both uh, the fiscal and monetary uh, interventions were uh, expected by MSMEs and uh, like uh, like 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 tax uh, related support, postponement of exemption of tax uh, payments, reduced tax rates, 
support related uh, to loan, such as the uh, postponement of subsidy for a, a payment, loan restructuring, uh, a guarantee or other assistance. These kind of the lump sum grants, uh, public procurement and uh, dissemination of information. Uh, these kind of things were, uh, were expected and invariably the most governments uh, have uh, in, uh, adopted uh, some form of for the others, this kind of support. For example, longer grace period or moratorium increase limit. Uh, a few governments, including India, had also offered payments from the government's share of employment provident fund. Similarly, Bangladesh uh, has also uh, offered uh, a interest rate uh, card and also uh, uh, various, uh, uh, this region, the countries have also uh, encouraged uh, the use of the innovative uh, platform, including uh, the digital uh, platform, though that is less. And one of the problems were uh, that as such, this region has is that the women participation, women participation in, in MSME and entrepreneurship, that is uh, relatively uh, low. And that is uh, the governments are working uh, out. But then, uh, as I said, that that uh, these uh, uh, are uh, the immediate measures that government have uh, initiated. Uh, but then uh, there are, uh, I think, uh, there are a lot more on a sustained basis uh, to be done uh, so that uh, these, uh, these uh, SMEs, they have particularly difficult uh, difficulties in terms of coping up with the uh, the devastation caused by the pandemic in multiple ways uh, so while the supply chain uh, they are integral part of the supply chain but then the supply chain shocks have a severe impact on msmes so employment uh, losses have been enormous which is very very detrimental for this uh, region but then uh, south south cooperation uh, can uh, help in terms of uh, experience sharing, good practices, then utilizing uh, the improved efficiency based on uh, uh, competitive advantages, economic recoveries, uh, supply side cooperation. Then private uh, uh, participation is also very, very important on, uh, certain, uh, on, on dealing with the overall issues. And what we uh, it's, it's found is that the various new these new opportunities, whatever little uh, posed by the this uh, uh, pandemic and which has forced many uh, most countries to think very differently, and things have changed fundamentally. Like for example, uh, building back better and then uh, digitization have uh, been the new uh, areas of interest. Skill development. And, uh, and 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 reskilling are uh, are very very uh, important and we what we found is that uh, since uh, this kind of uh, 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 changes uh, are uh, enormous and therefore the collective uh, measures and actions are more important uh, like we find that regional cooperation is more important than ever so uh, uh, let me uh, stop here uh, by uh, uh, if you have further question, Excellency, I can come back to you uh, uh, subsequently. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Uh, Saka. I, I, you know, I think you've put some really interesting points, and it's good to hear some of the interventions from the governments, you know, throughout the region, ranging from, um, you know, as you said, tech support, grants, loans, restructuring, you know, uh, moratorium, and so on. But I think one of the points that has been posed from time to time is that some of the measures are not reaching the MSMEs as they should, particularly the informal ones. For example, some people have said, and it is argued that, um, look, you know, these MSMEs, particularly the smaller ones, the informal ones, they are afraid to go to the banking sector. Um, they don't have any collateral. So you're offering me a loan when I don't have any collateral. Why do I need, I need, Livelihood, I, leave, I need intervention into livelihood to survive. 
So I don't need yeah. a, I need a grant or something. So you've heard some of those comments. So my question to you then is, do you think that these measures are reaching those who it should, it should reach? Uh, I would say yes and no. Uh, yes and no, like, uh, like uh, this, this uh, uh, a large section of MSMEs are getting, so there are uh, constraint from uh, 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 both sides, like in the sense that uh, supply side, if I may say so, like for example, uh, the, 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 these uh, countries, South Asian uh, countries are essentially uh, uh, developing countries and least developed countries. So fiscal constraints are there in uh, the, uh, and now the question of, but then despite that, these countries have uh, done, governments have done enormous amount of uh, reach out and uh, try to take all fiscal as well as monetary policies. I know a couple of countries uh, that they have uh, uh, done uh, quite a bit of uh, this thing. But now uh, the kind of, uh, uh, the size of MSMEs uh, are, are also equally significantly larger so that these funds and allocations uh, of course, are there, but then uh, it needs more. So overall supply demand, there is a little bit of uh, maybe uh, optimal. Uh, it may not be that optimal under the uh, grave condition post, uh, post uh, or during uh, the COVID uh, situation. And second thing is that if we see the, 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 the MSMEs, uh, they have particular like uh, if we see uh, that many uh, uh, MSMEs are uh, are only with uh, three four uh, uh, personnel, if I may say, or staffs. Like so, therefore, their size very marginal, and therefore they have access uh, in the pandemic time to the government procedures and others also an issue. Uh, but then again, governments, uh, various government have introduced the digital portal kind of things that would help. But then again, uh, as I said, that uh, the very nature uh, and characteristics uh, and constraint of uh, these MSMEs, these marginal ones particularly, they have uh, uh, difficulties in availing uh, certain facilities which otherwise are available. So therefore, like as I said, that uh, 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 complying with the the requirements at time are uh, also uh, time consuming and some uh, at times at, at times uh, uh, delay can delay things which itself by the time uh, the support reaches uh, the some of the uh, uh, staff would be already uh, asked to go on uh, temporary leave or something uh, so therefore there this is a challenge and uh, I think digitization uh, it, it is coming up in a uh, in a way which would be beneficial to uh, uh, both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, I think it's a fundamental point. Yes, that I think the saving grace may in fact be digitalization and getting people to become, you know, technology savvy, because yeah. it is one way of reaching, you know, all of those. MSMEs, you know, um, and, and true technology, and particularly given COVID and the fact that we couldn't have face-to-face -face interaction, we couldn't visit the banks and the institutions as they would like. I agree with you that I think digitalization and the use of technology, banking technology, banking access, and so on will be the, the way of the future. Thank you very much, sir. I will come back to you perhaps later on with another question. Thank Let you. me now to Ms. Pencham. Ms. Pencham, are you there? Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, uh, Mr. Kelvin. Yes, hi. I had four certain questions this morning, so I don't know where you want to begin, but perhaps you can give your thoughts on some of the issues which I raised this morning. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Um, go directly to the first question. Um, yeah, um, firstly, allow me to, to introduce uh, the ASEAN, ASEAN uh, for colleagues from other regions. We comprise uh, uh, 10 member countries. Um, 
um, from Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. If you uh, heard the names, uh, it comprises of the countries uh, with uh, developed countries like Singapore and Brunei, uh, and then like um, medium development country like Thailand, uh, Philippines, Indonesia, uh, and the uh, Philippines, as well as the developing countries, uh, for example, Cambodia, Laos. Myanmar and, and uh, a little bit higher uh, developed country like Vietnam. So we, uh, our, our MSME in, in 10 countries uh, uh, have uh, various stage of uh, development and various skill. Um, for, for coming to, to your first, first, you already asked, right? The first question on-, on Yeah, so, so maybe in your case, what I could probably, we could probably focus on because I saw you have a lot of um, toolkits, you talk about MSME toolkit and methodologies and whatnot. Right, so right. For you, we can talk about, um, let's say, um, capacity building and the role of capacity building and, and education and, and so on in MSMEs. Mm -hmm. What have your you know, organization been doing in that regard? Mm -hmm. but I, the, the second one I want you to, to answer for me really is, um, how can South South Corporation be deployed to support inclusive, sustainable, and resilient recovery from COVID-19 for MSMEs? Because as ASEAN, you know, I'm sure you've been uh, talking a lot about South South Corporation and all of these things. So these two issues really, capacity development and South South Corporation as a, you know, really important support to sustainable, resilient, and inclusive recovery. How can these things help? Okay, I'll just focus on, on what you, you asked on uh, capacity building. Uh, actually, capacity building is um, the things that uh, we, we never done enough uh, in, in, in any country for MSME. Uh, but uh, what I think is important that for, for, for the policymakers, uh, especially our, uh, for us, our uh, intergovernment uh, organization, is to understand what uh, MSME require and what, what SME needs uh, from last three years and now is different because of changing landscape, because of the crisis that um, uh, uh, hamper, hampering MSME. And then um, I think since uh, five years ago, we started uh, going uh, digital. Uh, we start in, uh, launching and implementing projects related to like uh, digital ASEAN Digital SME, and we had a uh, 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 digitalization project, uh, so-called ASEAN Access and ASEAN SME Online Academy. And uh, for ASEAN SME Online Academy is the one that we spearhead as the capacity building project that uh, MSME across uh, the region can uh, just log in to to, to the virtual course and curriculum online, uh, and then do the self-paced learning uh, for uh, to to fulfill the to fulfill to reskill upskill um, uh, or attend the course that they're interested for for the priority of the capsule building that we focus is on the uh, business continuity plan uh, during the crisis. Uh, as well as the financial literacy and management. We also do the upskill skill on um, digital uh, digitalization. Um, um, for th th that, that uh, for the SME Online Academy, which like um, every place that uh, SME um, engage in or um, enroll, they will get certified with the diploma and certificate as well. Um, for another type of capacity building is for policymakers. We, we didn't do uh, directly uh, direct capacity building much to MSME because we leave it to the National uh, SME Promotion Agency to carry out those programs to the MSME. But uh, for policymaker, we, uh, as the ASEAN Secretariat, we also do, uh, uh, we, we also uh, assess that policymakers of SME promotion agency in all 10 countries also need to have um, uh, 
a certain skill. So, and then we learned that uh, it's important for the government to put in place the safety net measures that uh, could be quickly and effect uh, effectively deployed to support SME in the future crisis. And we, and then we developed the guideline for the government that uh, will serve as reference for ASEAN policymakers to put in place measures to promote an SME resilience during and after the crisis, uh, including establishing the safety net mechanism, strengthening, strengthening MSME value chain and uh, smarter supply networks uh, by helping to develop in innovative and rapid solution out of the crisis. Uh, and uh, for raising awareness among stakeholders and building MSME preparedness and resilience for the future. Um, so we, we, uh, we carry out uh, capacity, capacity building initiative uh, both for uh, MSME uh, and uh, policymakers, and, but uh, in summary for MSME, we focus on the virtual one. Uh, come to the South South cooperation. When I was uh, given uh, the question on South South cooperation, actually I, I didn't have the very good experience in South South cooperation. But after I asked, uh, I, I read through the concept of South South cooperation is actually what we are doing. <laughs> it's like uh, cooperation among the region, uh, which like uh, uh, ASEAN is uh, currently. Uh, collaborating uh, not only uh, among the government agency, but also with the um, private sector and, and other uh, relevant bodies as well. Um, yesterday, we just uh, launched the, the, the media release uh, that we will convene the, uh, the fourth ASEAN Inclusive Business uh, Summit. Um, I'm sure the inclusive business is one of the trends that uh, all policymakers and, and um, relevant stakeholders will have in mind and uh, to sort of to promote uh, the awareness and, and adopt, adopt, adopting of the by, by the policymakers to, um, to include our um, the re or relevant stakeholders like youth, women, uh, minor groups, or uh, those at the bottom of pyramid in their uh, policies, in their initiatives. Uh, so in uh, um, on 22nd September next week, we will have the fourth ASEAN Inclusive Business Summit, which uh, will be organized by our current chair, uh, of ASEAN, uh, Brunei Darussalam, uh, but it's organized uh, like in hybrid uh, manner, like organized in Brunei and then have the virtual particip participation from all uh, 10 countries. We also uh, collaborate, um, South -South, we call, uh, under South South Corporation, we call, collaborate with uh, agency like um, the GIZ, um, UNSCAP, uh, OECD, and IBAN uh, for organizing this event. Um, through inclusive business, we also collaborate with the private sector representative called ASEAN Business Advisory Council to, um, uh, to put one category for the ASEAN Business Award. Uh, the category will be called the uh, awards in the inclusive business for for MSME in, in ASEAN. The ASEAN Business Award will be uh, organized in November this year by the ASEAN Business Advisory Council. That's about uh, capacity building and, and, and some, some cooperation uh, yeah. in, in ASEAN. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. You know, I think you've made some very important points and I like the point you made about business continuity. You know, the fact that, you know, what you will, you're intervening in SME resilience during and after the crisis, what needs to be done, innovative and rapid solutions, including capacity building and whatnot. I think this is very important and a very important intervention. And I also think when we talk about, you know, this whole discussion about supporting inclusive, sustainable and resilient recovery, I think you made an important point about the, yes, who are the ones that have been affected? The young women, the youth, the young men, those at the bottom. So therefore that any recovery that we need to speak to, any recovery going forward in the future, if it is to be inclusive, 
unsustainable, we need to take into consideration these people and what can be done. So I hope that coming out of your Asian Business Summit, you see, um, it would be interesting to get to, to see what are some of the ideas coming out of your Asian Business Summit in the next couple of days that speaks to the whole question of um, inclusive and sustainable and re resilient recovery. Because I always say that, you know, at the end of the day, it's about people we're talking about. But no matter what we do, no matter what policies we have in place, it is really about people supporting the vulnerable, bringing people out of poverty, ensuring greater equity in the whole process. And that's why we talk about building back better. This is what we mean by building back better. But things cannot be done the same way, but as we go forward in the future, and we need to take into the resilience and the sustainability and whatnot, all of those people who have been so seriously affected that whatever policy measures we put in place, we need to ensure that we build back better, taking into consideration all of those persons and what, what recovery and improvements mean for them. So thank you very much for, for, for your intervention. Um, let me now bring in Ms. Um, Green, I think it's, sorry, Ms. Esther Bates. Esther Bates is replacing Danielle Muno-Smith. Um, so Ms. Bates, are you there? Yes, I am. And I hope the internet will uh, will put up with me. I just had my video off because of the bandwidth. Yes, um, I, I have... we can always switch it off <laughs> if it begins to give trouble. Um, so sure, let me really interrupt me if you can't hear. Thank you. And important for you to really, I think really this whole question of um, the future of SMEs and entrepreneurship development, you know, uh, what trends do you think will shape and um, including like, let's say digitalization, but for you, I, I really want you to focus on greening and green recovery because you, you represent the Pacific Green Entrepreneurship Network. So I really want you to speak to this whole question of greening and, and what, what do we mean by greening and digitalization and these future trends and how can that assist in SME um, entrepreneurship and development? Over to you. Sure. I have some slides. Is that okay if I, if I share? That's quite okay. Okay, thank you. Just give me one second. You have rights to I... share? Yes, I believe so. Thank you. Okay, so um, do... Do feel free to uh, um, interrupt me if I if I take too long. I just kind of wanted to provide a bit of a background on GGI as well. Um, yes, you have so, 10 minutes in this first round and then we can always come back again in a, a second when we want to also want to leave some time for the audience to ask a few questions as well. Yeah, Thank you. sure, okay. Thank you. Um, so thanks very much, Mr. Kelvin, and um, apologies on behalf of my boss, Daniel, who was um, meant to make it today, but unfortunately could not. Um, so as I mentioned, to start off with, I'd just like to explain a little bit about GGI. As, um, some, sometimes people aren't aware of us. We're a relatively small um, inter intergovernmental organization. Um, so we're called the Global Green Growth Institute. Um, we're headquartered in, uh, in Korea, in Seoul. Um, and we have 39 member countries at the moment. Um, we're relatively young, having been established just in 2012. Um, and our president and chair is uh, the former UN Secretary General, uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. Um, so as you can see, like this, this map kind of shows we're in a, a lot of uh, well, quite widespread over where we are in, in, the, in the world. Um, however, I'm based in, in Fiji and in Suva um, in the big circle that you can see there. So I'm mostly talking about um, the Pacific uh, region today. Um, so within GGGI, we are um, embedded within, within our member partner governments. So normally if it's not COVID, we'll be uh, sitting within the Ministry of Economy in, in Suva, which is our um, partner government here. Um, within the Pacific, we, uh, we've been operating here since 2014 and we have full country programs in five countries, which is Fiji, Kiribati, Papua New Guinea, Tonga and Vanuatu, um, and our regional headquarters is in Fiji. Um, we are not very big, we have about 30 staff in the region, um, but we have a very collaborative approach and we always partner with organizations um, where we can because we understand that the development challenges we're trying to address are much bigger um, than we are. So just a couple of examples of, of the projects that we do in the region. Um, in Kiribati, uh, my colleagues are working on the Kiribati Climate Smart Agriculture Program, which is funded by the Qatar Fund for Development. Um, and today I'll be mostly talking about the um, Pacific Green Entrepreneurs Network, which Mr. Kelvin already mentioned. 
project, um, which is a regional project spanning um, six, six countries, also funded by um, Qatar Fund for Development. Um, so maybe just briefly, I'll touch on, I, I wasn't sure about the Pacific is, you know, it's, it's quite a different type of region, perhaps from the, the other presenters who, who've already spoken, which is, and it's been very interesting, so thank you. Um, I just thought I'd share a few statistics that we've recently um, had from businesses, so the private sector on the left and um, more specifically on MSMEs on the right. Um, so very similar to what um, Kelvin's already set up earlier, as you can imagine, um, the, well, the Pacific's been basically closed off to the rest of the world since March last year. Um, in Fiji, where I'm living, and my colleague Rashika, who's also here at Living, we've, we've been in basically very strict lockdown for the past five months. Um, we have very small and undiversified economies, very heavily reliant on tourism in some countries. Um, and so obviously that's meant, meant that there's been big hits to economies and jobs have also taken a big hit. Um, the MSMEs are obviously crucial to, to the survival of the economies in, in, in any region and the Pacific's no different. Um, half, um, quite worryingly, half of the small businesses that were surveyed just recently have said that they are either closed already or they're expecting to permanently close. As you can see, you know, unsurprisingly, um, almost all businesses have decreased profitability um, and revenue as well. And in terms of the, the government support, this is the, the, I think the main point that I was trying to address here is that um, those who have been surveyed um, for, for the small businesses, MSMEs, about roughly two thirds across the region, this is across 13 countries that were surveyed, um, have accessed governmental support. Um, however, 82% are still currently seeking financial support. So they're, they're still needing money just to keep the lights on, keep people employed and the business ticking over. Um, and while I don't have the information specifically for MSMEs, but in general for the private sector, there's definitely that gender uh, disparity that we've heard some speakers already mention as well. So women-led businesses are definitely facing greater barriers. 64% um, of the female-led businesses are saying that they have barriers to prevent them um, accessing the initiatives for support, which is including the government support, um, compared to 51% of the male-led businesses. Um, and in terms of those who've actually accessed government support, only 27% of women-led businesses have actually received the support compared to 40% of male-led enterprises. Um, this is overall, I mean, they're, they're slightly different cohorts, so it's just sort of to give you a bit of a flavour um, and try not to dissect the, uh, the information too much in there. Um, so now more about what act actually um, we're doing at GGGI. Um, so the Pacific Green Entrepreneurs Network, as, as mentioned, is the project that I'm managing. Um, and we're really um, interested in supporting entrepreneurs here because we recognize the need to work closely with the private sector to enable the green transition. Um, and then the, you know, the, the, the phrases build back better um, and uh, you know, green recovery have already been mentioned. And um, in the Pacific, certainly climate change adaptation is forefront to people's mind both before the pandemic and now even more so um, beyond that as well. Um, and in the Pacific, you know, there's no debate about does climate change exist or not because sea levels are rising, we're having more severe, um, you know, weather events and, and cyclones and, and that sort of thing. And I'm sure that's the same for many of your countries as well. Um, so we're, it, it's not a hard sell to get people to think about um, uh, going more green in, in the recovery efforts. Whereas in, you might be able to tell from my accent, I'm originally, well, sort of originally from Australia and that's quite a different story there. So at GGI, we see um, the need to support a new generation of green entrepreneurs because they're, um, we think that they're uniquely positioned as the drivers of innovation um, and they hold the keys to unlocking a transition to a, what we call a green and sustainable future for our planet. Um, so, the major initiative that we're implementing in this region is to support the growth of a regional entrepreneurship ecosystem, um, largely working with the private sector, but also with our government um, stakeholder partners as well. Uh, to facilitate, we, we understand that Pacific um, entrepreneurs already have great solutions that address the problems here, and we just want to help um, those great ideas get to the next level um, and, and develop some, some traction and, and move beyond the, um, the state that they currently are in. So I think I already mentioned that we're in um, 
we're operating across six countries. Um, those countries are Fiji, where I'm based, Kiribati, Papua New Guinea, Samoa, Tonga, and Vanuatu. Um, and the programs, it's a three-year project um, that's just starting this year. So we're focused on women and youth because we know that um, you know, all the data tells us that there's greater unemployment for these, these demographics. Um, and these are the, the businesses also as entrepreneurs, they, they struggle the most with getting support that they, um, to grow. So before I go any further, I should explain what, is, what do we call green entrepreneurs? Um, so our definition at GGGI of green entrepreneurs is any business or enterprise that's purpose-driven um, so it, they, are, they could be environmental, environmentally focused, or they could be social um, impact uh, driven as well. Um, and, but importantly, they also need to be building wealth. So they need to be in the private sector, but they are not just for, um, for profit. They have a, a, a second or third um, you know, bottom line, I guess. Um, so the green businesses that we're working with, they could be across any sector. Some examples are, you know, agribusiness, ecotourism, natural beauty products, reusable nappies and menstrual products, bicycle rental, um, natural handicrafts, pesticides, renewable energy, and, and so on. It could be um, many different things. Um, and as mentioned, you know, access to finance has been like the key, um, the key stumbling block for, for entrepreneurs in the region, and that's not, un not unusual globally. So um, because of this, uh, through, our, through our program, we've got funds of um, over a million US dollars, which will be providing um, in uh, various types of grants, both to an incubator and accelerator, accelerator program um, to support businesses at different levels of, of growth um, to, to um, I guess, unlock the next stage of, of their growth and, and, and um, also then to facilitate their connections with other investors, whether it's commercial banks or other, um, other invest investors in the region to, um, to leverage these even more. Um, so perhaps I won't spend too much time on this one, but this is just to show the sort of three main aspects of the program. We have an incubator program, accelerator program, and then the entrepreneurship ecosystem. The, entrepreneurship ecosystem I'll sort of maybe talk about where I think that's got the strongest connection although I think the whole program really we are we are um, following the south-south cooperation or triangular cooperation um, approach although we don't necessarily use that language um, similar to my ASEAN colleague um, so in terms of capacity building so that certainly when we were doing um, consultations and surveys of um, within the region we certainly found that um, apart from access to finance there was certainly a need um, that's seen by entrepreneurs and those supporting entrepreneurs for further uh, training, um, also confidence building um, that they, you know, for entrepreneurs to know how to take the next step. Um, people, especially uh, people who are passionate about um, a particular environmental or social problem um, may not necessarily have a business background. Um, and that's what we're trying to address with our program is to help them have some um, business modeling to put around their idea to really make it viable and to grow. Um, which is so. I was also interested to hear about my ASEAN colleague mentioning um, some similar, perhaps perhaps a bit similar work as well there. Um, so, yeah, I think maybe I'll also just mention here that um, in in addition to capacity building through formal training, we also see an important part of the program as local mentoring. So in the Pacific, um, it's we we see that um, you know as mentioned, the Pacific. Uh, solution pacific problems are are unique um and and the local people really kind of they're, they're actually able to address much better than than i could as someone who spent time in the pacific but still i'm not a local um you know to really address those problems so we're really trying to um, pair up locals um to to help provide advice and and support and, and help to make the connections um in order to to go further Um, so in terms of the South-South cooperation, this is um, where I've sort of drawn the, the clearest link with the regional ecosystem part of our program. Um, so we're looking to um, provide support both to entrepreneurs across the region. I should mention with our incubator program, we're looking to work with um, around 360 entrepreneurs across the region over three years, uh, which is quite ambitious for a very small uh, population uh, countries uh, with po combined population of around 10 million people. Um, and, and a very nascent ecosystem, but we're really trying to generate that interest and excitement um, in, in green 
green enterprise and green um, recovery. So one level of um, the networking um, and connections that, that we see as important is obviously connecting entrepreneurs from different countries or both within country and also across country to share their learnings, share their experiences and just also just to support each other and, um, you know, be struggling along with the same similar things together, which is often um, very helpful, even if it doesn't solve any issues to know you're not alone. Um, the, still, another, uh, yep. Yeah, so I think I, if you can perhaps wrap up in a minute or so, because I want to now bring in the listening audience after. So if you can. Sure. sure. Okay. So I'll just, I was just going to mention on that point that we're also working. So one important aspect here is we're trying to work with, we're, we're partnering with local business support organizations on the ground to implement our program so that uh, it improves sustainability beyond the life of a program. And also really that the local, as mentioned previously, the locals really understand the context better. Um, they've already been doing work there and we're leveraging off that. So I think it just naturally be kind of becomes that, um, that connection of that South-South um, support from each of those business support organizations we're working with to connect across the region as well. And sorry, just briefly on that last point that you wanted me to talk about, and of course that was my last one, <laughs> is just on the future trends. So certainly green recovery is the, is the big um, buzzword at the moment or one of the big buzzwords at the moment. And yes, so, um, I think... Obviously, um, what the, our program is, is aimed at that in terms of helping to build jobs and build inclusive green jobs um, through, through MSMEs. Um, I think we're also considering, I, I'd consider that digitalization is actually part of the green recovery. It's actually one aspect of how we see um, MSMEs can practically move um, to, to reduce their carbon footprint, reach out to new markets and, and that kind of thing. It, also within the green economy, I mean, we're, we're looking at um, how uh, SMEs can create the um, new value chains and create additional value add within those value chains. Um, and as oh, I, I hadn't mentioned before, but I can also add that specific businesses, they may not necessarily call themselves green entrepreneurs, we're, we're the ones calling them that. But there is just this, um, there's there is quite a consistency of businesses giving back to their either their communities or, or making some impact into the environment um, in where they're, wherever their business is located. So it's not uh, too much of a step in the region to then say we should formalize this and we should call, we can we can label it and, and sort of demystify these terms and help bring businesses on board. Because um, often I think that the discussion about um, green recovery um, as it needs to be is, is led at a policy level and that's super important to make to, to create an enabling environment. Um, but I think with my with my program we're trying to sort of bring it down to that practical level with the private sector and see how we can work with the small businesses on the ground to make that work. Um, and mm -hmm. sorry I've probably gone on too yeah. long so I'll <laughs> stop there. Thanks. Thanks. I, I like your last slide, you know, your final slide really. You know, I think drives home the point about green recovery and, you know, how SMEs can become part of greening, you know, by being involved, as you say, in local value chains, um, accelerating innovation in green products and processes. That's a very important point. You know, greening businesses and green jobs. You know, I know we talk about green jobs, you see, but the greening of businesses is also, you know, very important and will be important as we go um, forward in the future. So thanks a lot for your contribution. Um, we're running out of time now. So I want to invite some questions from participants. Um, you can pose your questions either to any member of the panelists. Um, any, any panelists, you can pose your questions to or, or, or general, and we can get someone to answer. But let me invite any questions now from our listening participants. Good morning. May I say something? Yes, please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. I am uh, ACD Secretary General. Uh, first of all, I like to thank um, the organizing uh, committee for extending uh, the kind invitation to me uh, to attend today's event. Um, I, as far as uh, this uh, breakout session three is concerned, uh, I have uh, a few points uh, to share to share with you. First of all, uh, as part of the ACT, which comprises uh, 35 countries in Asia, we have uh, organized um, a virtual uh, seminar uh, with the uh, private sector in order to get uh, first-hand experience from them as far as uh, 
uh, the impact of COVID-19 is concerned and uh, whether or not the um, government uh, measures uh, is in fact uh, the uh, solution as expected. Uh, we've got uh, the, um, the outcome that um, many of them, uh, if not all, uh, do appreciate uh, government uh, measures in order to uh, uh, regain uh, economic uh, recovery uh, as soon as possible. However, it seems like uh, uh, nothing is enough, <laughs> I would say, and uh, they expect uh, more, particularly from uh, bigger uh, corporations in order to help them with uh, employment, uh, including uh, innovation. Um, regarding uh, digitalization, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I, I just would like uh, to share with you that um, uh, we, 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 we thought that uh, e-commerce uh, probably is the uh, most effective mode, uh, at least for the time being. Uh, but uh, there are some uh, challenges that we, that we may have to, to overcome, uh, particularly uh, infrastructure, let alone um, uh, internet coverage or uh, access that may or may not be uh, uh, available uh, throughout uh, the country. Uh, that is one. Uh, secondly, uh, even though there may be some uh, legal framework available in, in many uh, countries, but still, um, uh, as far as uh, MSMEs are concerned, they may not be able to uh, get um, comprehensive uh, understanding uh, of uh, the uh, impact of uh, dispute settlement. Um, so they may be uh, able to uh, trade, but may uh, come across uh, uh, legal disputes uh, in the future. So these are something that we, we may have to uh, bear in mind, uh, other than uh, the fact that uh, they need uh, more uh, uh, capacity building in order to associate themselves with uh, e-commerce. So thank you very much uh, for, for your time. Thank you, sir, um, for your intervention. Um, any other questions coming in? Yes, yeah. Uh, thank you uh, for giving floor to me again. Um, we here in Economic Cooperation Organization, uh, we are facing uh, with a number of challenges in terms of uh, supporting SMEs. Challenges regarding the security. So when I talk about the security, as uh, uh, it covers the policies, rules, and regulations, we we don't have harmonized policies for supporting SMEs in a region. Uh, when we talk about the regional integration, that SMEs uh, are part of this integration, we should go to harmonizing policies, rules, and regulations. The other aspect of security is, is uh, security of the uh, entrepreneurs. For example, uh, in Afghanistan, unfortunately, we have security uh, problem. Uh, as far as we have security concern, in a country like Afghanistan, we cannot go to, to capacity building programs, to sharing of uh, using technologies experiences like these things. Uh, we in ECO, we are uh, doing our best to at least address those challenges uh, that uh, we can do in close cooperation with other countries. For example, harmonizing standards. Harmonizing standards uh, for, uh, for agriculture products. Uh, 
to meet one uh, standard, one certificate for uh, agriculture products, for example, organic products. Uh, it's, it's one of the main projects that we have in our region that, uh, that, uh, that uh, can support SMEs. Uh, so, ECO uh, welcomes uh, cooperation from other uh, regions uh, in, in this respect, and uh, we are ready to define joint program for achieving these goals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very important point, I think, um, that you have raised there, Andy. Um, and you talked about harmonization. If you're a South South cooperation, we need to have some kind of harmonization of um, entrepreneurial policies. And in throughout the region, they might have different kind of policies in each country. So how do we harmonize these policies and make it easier for people to start a business, to register a business? This is an important point, I think. And yes, the issue of security, Afghanistan, again, you know, the people are not secure. When we in the ILO, we have a, a wonderful program going there called Roads to Jobs now. We can't even do it. And this was about capacity of MSMEs. No, we can't even do it. And we, we have to see what happens in, in, in the future. So very, very important point. Now we have four more minutes before I wrap up and then I go with my you know, colleague to try to pull the points together before we go back into plenary. We have four more minutes, but in the four more minutes, I want to pose one question to all the panelists and you will take one minute each to answer them. And my question to you is, can MSMEs offer decent work alongside some business practices? What can we do at the regional level for this to happen? So can we have decent work and some business practice together? What can we do about it at the regional level? Let me start first of all with Pencham. Pencham, any thoughts on this? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, right? Sorry. Please, please, yes, please go ahead. Okay, yes, sorry. Um, um, we um, under ASEAN uh, SME framework, we uh, we are working under uh, ASEAN SME uh, strategic action plan for uh, SME development 2016 to 2025, and one of the key uh, ambition or um, our goal of um, us is like um, trying to to develop our SME to be able to integrate into the regional and global supply chain. Um, by doing so, we we have uh, put a lot of uh, efforts in in uh, doing the reskilling, upskilling uh, our SMEs, uh, especially those uh, with uh, uh, capacity to to grow abroad and uh, ready to to export. Uh, their products to the regional uh, value chain of our supply chain. Uh, and we try to integrate them to, to the um, medium size and large size enterprise uh, so that they, they work together and uh, it may be in terms of the internship or um, the, the, the um, uh, having uh, SMS, uh, micro and small SME like uh, exchange uh, program with the large company. Yeah, we, we try to 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 integrate our MSME to to other uh, um, larger business. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Saka, any thoughts on the issue? Yeah, thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Yes. Uh, I think there is no option you have given whether it is possible. It will have to be done. I mean, according to me, I mean, this thing, you see the enormous amount of employment generation, enormous amount of livelihood. So it cannot uh, be ignored. So now the issue is that efforts would need to be from both sides, like for, rather than the, the all sides, like uh, it's uh, the MSM itself, uh, then the the government and other stakeholders, and also uh, the technology uh, transfers, and then uh, the 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 cooperation. Uh, it, it it is not any individual 
or any sector's uh, uh, job. It's need uh, the joint effort. So there has to be, since we have the backing of the uh, SDGs and other, uh, other goals that have been uh, wild, uh, worldwide accepted, we need to take advantage of that. And we should need to work together to ensure decent work and also diversification and the adoption of the new technologies, which uh, including digitization, uh, but then that has problems, which is like essentially that that are less of uh, employment intensive, labor intensive. So therefore, thank you, that uh, is uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. Um, Esther, um, you, I'm running out of time, but your quick two cents on this issue of decent work and business practices. Sure. I mean, I think, yes, absolutely. I think especially when we're working, in, in my case, we're working with purpose-driven entrepreneurs. So, I mean, if you're, whether you're environmentally or socially focused, I think it's, um, you, it needs, you need to take a holistic approach. You need to be paying your employees well. You need to be giving them good working conditions, making sure their um, working environments are, are safe. Um, I know ILO has done a lot of great work in, in this area, which I've previously used in, in, in other work. And um, I, I think that there are some practical tools out there that we can use. Uh, one last point I would just leave with is, I think it's certainly easier if we can drive the demand for that from customers, because if customers are demanding that, um, it'll be a lot easier for businesses to comply, especially if there's costs involved. But we can only drive from customers if they're educated and if they know what their rights are. A lot of people don't know uh, even the MSMEs don't know what their rights are, particularly and talk about business and human rights and those kind of things. A lot of them don't really know what it's about, you know? So I think I am really out of time. Let me ask the panelists to all turn on their camera if I can get a quick picture from everybody, a group picture from everybody, because I now need to sit down with my colleagues so that I can wrap up all that we discussed before we go back in plenary in the next eight minutes or so. So we can all turn on our cameras. Thank you, everybody. Who are we can, in, including my rapporteur and my support, support staff, if we can all turn on our cameras, I can do a lovely good picture. Um, so if you're all ready, shall, shall I, shall we take one? Okay. Yes, you can also take one, thanks. Ready, one, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. Also, our mo moderator, shall I turn on, uh, share my screen and put the notes up so that we can start wrapping up? Yes, maybe we can all do that now. Yes. So if you can share with a number of issues came out of this very rich panel here today. Um, on, you know, we talked on so many issues early. So maybe let's put up your screen and we can share with everybody. We can see what we will take back to plenary. Everyone see my screen? Yes, I can see it clearly. You want to run through or do we just read? Oh, uh, do we want to go by one by one or? Well, I think the first point you talked about the role of the regional inter inter intergovernmental organization um, and the fact that some of the economic cooperation organization is currently developing sub sectoral approach as much as possible, diminishing the negative impact of COVID-19, especially in the particular sectors regional economy, including intra-regional trade, supply chain, MSMEs, SMEs. Most governments in South Asia have invariably in reduced interest rates or given longer grace periods or moratorium, increased limits on non-performing assets to prevent 
again insolvency a few governments including india had offered payments for the government's share of employee provident fund to avoid layoff also banks as well have introduced special purpose loans has reduced rates yes and the and i will remove the asean part because uh kun pen chan has shared with us earlier but she didn't present well um you can leave it because it's okay. part of the um documents which we have so that's okay yes um so this is some of the interventions and the and the impacts we talked about okay if you can go to number 3 yes. capacity building we had a lot of discussion today on capacity building financial literacy upskilling and reskilling to adapt to the increasing digitalized world access to capacity building including training workshops are extremely valuable as it will help in sharing best practices ideas knowledge as well as exchanging effectiveness in the SME sector ASEAN secretariat provides capacity building for practitioners and policy makers for MSMEs they offer SME online academy to upskill and attend courses including financial literacy and business continuity plans for policy makers as well ASEAN Secretariat assess what kind of skills are required to create an enabling environment during and post crisis. The GGGI Green Good Industry provide capacity building, including confidence building through its regional network, green enterprise and recovery, connecting entrepreneurs within and across countries, also partnering with local SME support organizations to have better understanding on situation on the ground. We talked about some trends as well. South South Corporation, what do we, how can South South Corporation help through networking, knowledge sharing in terms of sharing of good practices, success stories, and better integration in the areas of supply chain among entrepreneurs, business support organizations, and policy makers, promote inclusive business recovery, for example, the Fourth Inclusive Asian Business Summit, cooperation with development cooperation agencies and the private sector, the SSC may be utilized to improve efficiency in the areas of sectors based on comparative advantages. Operation in improving data systems will be useful, leveraging on the resources of the private sector, in particular the larger businesses. Promotion of technical cooperation between countries, very importantly. Main issues from the discussion for any presentation, inclusive and sustainable businesses are building back better to support women and marginalized groups. I think the point about women is important and we need to stress it. We still have digit digitalization, greening infrastructure, the legal framework, of course, important. Lack of harmonized policies, rules and regulations for the region, something we need to think about. And the issue of security as well. Entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship need security at all times if their businesses are to succeed. So let's see what are some of the recommendations in two minutes time. Uh, ensuring ad addressing both supply side as well as demand side bottlenecks, capacity building and skills development, use of e-commerce platforms, ensuring transparent and fair markets and encouraging them to become a part of the supply chain, collective actions, harmonizing standards and policies. Yes. And of course, the question about decent work and some businesses generally, we, we accept that um, there, there's no doubt about it. We need to have decent work and some businesses together. So I think these are the main points. I don't know how much time we'll have to present, but uh, hopefully what, you, what we can do is pick up, I think, some of the major points up front and then the recommendations I think you will want to stress on, you know, coming out of the panel, the points about need for harmonization, the legal framework, all of these things. Recommendations. All Thank you, this. Kevin. Oh, actually, Dennis has raised his hand. Yes, please, Dennis. Oh, you can't see any hands. Go ahead, Dennis. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Um, I just wanted to kind of reward somebody who gave a very pointed uh, recommendation. The Sorry, the, which, I didn't get the point. Can you hear me? The yes, I'm, I'm here. The representative from ECO. Uh, specifically said, said they would welcome cooperation from other regional institutions to address some of the issues that they raised 
constraints. I think we should reflect that since they were so open about inviting others. Yes, 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 I agree, I agree, I agree. Oh, Dennis, could you please repeat? A representative from ECO will welcome cooperation. ECO welcome cooperation from other regional institutions to address the constraints ECO is facing, which you have captured, by the way, you have captured. Yeah, I think generally, I'm sure that general point is that um, I'm sure that all of these institutions re represented here today will, of course, welcome more yeah. cooperation, you know, from the region, um, right. you know, for better efficiency and survival of the MSME sector um, coming out of COVID. Right. Yeah. Oh, so I think now we're all called back to join the plenary. Well, I think, yes, we have to go back now. So we need to leave the room and go back to plenary. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank, thank you, all thank our you, respected Kevin. and honorable speakers yes, and participants for you. joining and listening. Local disaster risk reduction for COVID-19. 14 southern countries received medical equipment, including 54 ventilators, 10 ambulances, over 30 hospital beds, and more than 1.2 million personal protective equipment. An e-learning platform for doctors and nurses, which had developed software and equipped remote healthcare providers in Vietnam, produced a module on COVID-19 training. In Sierra Leone, the Digital Loan and Emergency COVID-19 credit product has reached to over 15,000 underserved community members. South-South Galaxy, an artificial intelligence-driven digital global platform, attracted 300 partners to virtually share their knowledge. It also enabled sharing over 600 solutions. 257 think tanks were brought together for frontier research. During this decade of action, 20 UN system entities are implementing projects across the four funds managed by the UNOSSE, capitalizing on their operational presence across the globe. In 2020, the combined portfolio of the four UNOSSE trust fund enabled 91 projects across 53 countries, as well as regional and global initiatives. These four trust funds vary significantly. The India, Brazil and South Africa facility for poverty and hunger alleviation, operational since 2006, is a remarkable example of coordinated action by three southern countries, working jointly with the UN system for the benefit of other developing countries. The India, Brazil and South Africa Fund has directly supported 31 developing countries with $40 million. Through the Perez Guerrero Trust Fund since 1983, the Ministers of Foreign Affairs of the group of 77 member states annually approve small research and collaboration projects that have directly benefited 134 countries in areas of critical importance to the Global South such as trade, technology, agriculture and technical cooperation. The India UN Development Partnership Fund was established in 2017 to provide $150 million to sustainable development projects in fellow developing countries. The UN Fund for South-South Cooperation was created in 1995 by the United Nations General Assembly. In the last decade, it has received over $30 million in contributions from over 40 partners, mostly UN member states. China has been UNFSSE's major contributor, supporting global initiatives. UNFSSE also hosts a facility sponsored by the Republic of Korea focused on promoting cooperation in science, technology, and innovation. The funds managed by UNOSSC are linked by one common element. They are guided by South-South principles and are a key instrument through which the UNOSSC delivers on its mandate of UN-wide system coordination and facilitation of South-South cooperation. 
They mainstream policy into practice, utilizing South-South and triangular cooperation to address common development challenges. Dear panelists, moderators, and participants, thank you for coming back to the main session. I hope you had a wonderful discussion. Now I would like to invite the moderators of each session to lead us in sharing the summary of discussions in their respective breakout sessions. Mr. Fukuda, Chief Advisor from Japan International Cooperation Agency is the moderator for session one on climate change and great development. May I ask if you would like to share your re reflections on session one before calling on the rapporteur to brief participants on the tea takeaways. Mr. Fukuda, are you there? All right, uh, I guess Fukuda-san has lost his connection maybe. Uh, so Quinn uh, Narapak, may I invite you to take the floor to share with us the key takeaways. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I would like to brief uh, all the guests and, and participants on the key takeaway of the breakout section one uh, on climate change and, and, and green development. So panelists provided responses to the questions on the role of their regional organizations in facilitating climate change actions and uh, the challenges faced by um, their regions, Pacific and South Asia regions, as well as the opportunities identified for further actions. Um, the distinguished uh, panelist, Ambassador Solomara, Sec uh, Secretary General of Pacific Islands Development Forum Secretariat, PIDF, he mentioned that responses to COVID-19 and climate actions are not mutually ex exclusive. The, extens uh, the existential uh, threat of climate change should not be at the, at the expense of COVID-19 responses. PIDF has been taking an important role in strengthening Pacific voice in collective uh, climate actions and building towards a resilient, uh, robust green economy. For example, the Yusuva Declaration on Climate Change uh, that call for the need to limit the global temperature to 1.5 degree. He further discussed the challenges faced by the Pacific region, which include number one, um, the increase of sea level, two, financing needs for achieving a climate, res uh, climate change, uh, climate resilience, three, how to incentivize uh, the stakeholders to take uh, climate actions, and finally, the differences in national policies in uh, the Pacific region. In terms of opportunity, uh, he mentioned that uh, renewable energy is one of the ways forward towards green economic development and the engagement with private sector and civil society organization uh, should be further enhanced to foster a balanced development in the Pacific. Um, from our second uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Masuma Rama, Director General of South Asia Cooperative Environment Program. Um, he mentioned that the, uh, uh, the program has have been playing an important role in centered sizing and also outreaching to topics in collaboration with other partners, including multilateral financing in institutions. In terms of the challenges, there is a combination of national policy planning and standards, um, limited technology access, inadequate knowledge among the end users, and the lack of financing mechanisms and financiers for climate adaptation and mitigation measures in the, in the South Asia region. For the opportunity, uh, he discussed about um, the creation of a market for climate resilience infrastructure, uh, how climate smart uh, uh, agriculture, renewable energy and sustainable transport, uh, as well as industrial uh, energy efficiency and green 
and resilient building can be good investment opportunities for the region. It would be also important for the region to enhance stakeholder partnerships and community participations, um, and also in, incorporate sustainability in education programs and investing in research and technology transfer. Furthermore, he also mentioned that strengthening uh, environmental governance, governance is, also, is also important for fostering green development. Moving on to uh, our next uh, panelist uh, from Escape, Mr. Uh, Yusuf uh, Mayava. Uh, he mentioned that Escape is the most inclusive intergovernmental platform in Asia Pacific region that can promote inclusive participation and discourse of member states on emerging issues by facilitating regional approaches and using the intergovernmental platform as a guidance platform for deliberating collective actions and building policy consensus in line with global decisions. The challenges uh, faced in the Pacific region that he identify, uh, identified include sea level rises and the impact to the economy due to ocean warming, which will uh, uh, decimate uh, fisheries and also the bleaching of corals. He further uh, uh, highlighted that COVID-19 responses should not delay global climate actions, which may in turn delay the transition to green economy. And the ambitions should include the moral imperative. And finally, moving to our last panelist, Ms. Ofa Kaisami, Manager of uh, Pacific Climate Change Center of the Secretariat of Pacific Regional Environment Program. She mentioned that um, uh, the program acts as the knowledge center of excellence and provides applied uh, research and capacity building activities through training and innovation to drive greater action on climate change in the Pacific region. For example, the Pacific Climate Change Center since uh, 2019 has rolled out uh, executive courses in which climate finance is one of the focuses. A network of climate change researchers is established to improve participation in the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Processes. Collaboration, um, um, uh, she mentioned that collaboration is possible in developing tools to mainstream climate change adaptation and mitigation, research, education, and training programs, and the use of new information and communication technologies can be shared to enhance the effectiveness of adaptation uh, initiative and inform policy uh, formation on climate actions. So uh, that's conclude. Uh, the wrap up of uh, breakout section one. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Queen Chelsea. Thank you for the wrap up. So we also have the pleasure of inviting Professor Shabazz Khan, Director and UNESCO representative to the People's Republic of China, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Japan, Mongolia, and the Republic of Korea as our moderator for session two on digital transformation. Professor Shabazz, may I invite you to take the floor? Thank you very much. I'm not going to give the full report because Kate has done a wonderful job. I believe in that. So she has been our panelist as well as she's going to report many good ideas. I just want to give an overview. From the four panelists we have, very competent people. Uh, Mr. Masanori representing uh, the Asia Pacific Valley community, Professor Bambang showing us innovation, what is happening in the academia. Ms. Atsuko giving us ideas of regional ITU efforts and very importantly, Kate gave us many ideas of whole of society. In a very simple way, with these four panelists and the questions and answers session, I first of all say, I feel I'm digitally transformed. So we are doing a wonderful job under the South of Cooperation umbrella. Digital transformation is already happening. COVID has certainly accelerated many things, and this is very clear from academia. Things which would have were going to take another five years, they have happened now. Also, very important to note is that uh, the role of the ICT-related ministries 
and the work which they have been doing, how it can mainstream into the whole of the government approach. So how do we make sure there is a proper bandwidth which is needed for doing digital transformation related work in every country? So there are digital divides there. That's where we also learned very importantly from ITU, how can we actually use satellite technologies versus terrestrial technologies? How can we ensure proper bandwidth? How can we actually promote more dialogue among nations to move forward on this uh, dig digital galaxy as we have the South South galaxy? Digital galaxy also need to move forward. Very importantly, three concepts have come through. One concept is whole of the government approach. And whole of the government means we need to bring the digital transformation into all those areas which are necessary, the health, the education, the areas related to e-commerce, the areas related to bringing benefits uh, to uh, all those people who are vulnerable people. So whole of the government approach, whole of society approach, a systems approach. And in this regard, how can we make sure that the lessons which have been learned by the nations who moved very fast uh, can be shared with the nations who need those understandings, especially cyber security, cyber crime, cyber related social issues, how we need to move forward on those with the proper kind of frameworks. And it is a consensus that our SDGs is the proper framework where digital transformation can help nations through social cooperation and triangular cooperation. So I really thank all the four excellent panelists and I'm sure you will hear a lot more interesting ideas coming from Kate who has been actively uh, putting all those ideas into her reporting. Thank, thank you very much. And I am thankful to uh, everyone for a wonderful session and for uh, UN Office of South South Cooperation to invite me to moderate this session. I really enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Shabazz. Uh, Kate, may I invite you to take the floor then? Okay, I'm not sure I have too much more to add and I'm aware that we're running short of time, but I'll just have a, uh, an, uh, a look at our key points. Um, so yes, how can resources like bandwidth be shared sustainably across the region long-term? How can ICT ministries consider their roles to capture opportunities across um, different areas of government, um, this whole of government approach, which has already been uh, elaborated on. Um, how can we ensure that inclusion is a key part of, you know, policy making and, and future policy around ICT and digital uh, within governments across the region? Um, new models of collaboration are needed for this new digital era. era. So how can academia and the private sector government and civil society work together because everybody has sort of different resources, different networks, different um, uh, experience that can be built on and, and how can this drive um, change. Um, we talked uh, quite a bit about South-South cooperation in the context of Asia Pacific being, you know, some incredibly developed countries and those who are um, more uh, less developed and, and, uh, and slower in the take up and how to really um, share information on a kind of peer basis uh, and share learning. Um, and, and as we've just, as it's just been alluded to that whole of society and systems approach to digital so that we see it as an enabler to achieve um, social impact rather than an end in itself. And we had some fantastic uh, presentations that were um, from a very high level um, all the way down to um, some great examples of, you know, digital, of digital um, COVID transformation within uh, un universities and academic institutions. What can ministries of IT do? Um, the introduction of digital uh, smart islands and smart villages. So a great conversation um, and, and some great ideas to share with you and hopefully to be taken forward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Kate Sutton. Uh, and uh, now we have Mr. Calvin Sargent, Sustainable Enterprise uh, Devo Development Specialist from IOO Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. He is a moderator for session three on SMEs and entrepreneurship. Mr. Sargent, would you like to share your, your insights on the session first before inviting the rapporteur to take the floor? Thank you very much. And um, good morning to everyone, afternoon as well, wherever that, may, that time may be. 
No, I think this was a really wonderful panel, very provocative, interesting points, which were raised. We had representative Dr. Said from the Economic Cooperation Organization. We had Mr. Penchal from SAC. We had um, Ms. Um, Penchan from ASEAN, and we had Ms. Um, Esther Bates from the Pacific Green Entrepreneurship Network. And I think they all really responded to a number of questions which were posed to them earlier, a number of questions that thought to look at the impact of COVID on MSME, whether it was reaching um, those who it had intended to, to reach, issues of capacity development and, and, and greening and whatnot. And I think generally um, some of the key takeaways were one that the policy measures, a number of countries introduced policy measures um, throughout the region, ranging from grants to loans, from moratorium, um, you know, both Mr. Saka and Dr. Said, you know, spoke to these issues. I mean, in India, for example, they actually use the pension fund as well, you know, as a means of providing some support to MSMEs. But I think generally it's agreed that it's 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 mixed really. For the more formal enterprises, you know, one can argue that the measures have been reaching, the support has been reaching them. But the informal ones, you know, and in this region, there are a large number of informal MSMEs. They are not, it is not reaching them for all kinds of reasons, maybe due to um, access, due to the risk, due to um, capacity, all of these kind of reasons, you know, the, the, the point is that it may not be reaching as we would like. So we would like to see certainly greater efforts as it relates to, to reach and the policy measures reaching these informal MSMEs. We had a rich discussion as well on capacity development. Both Ms. Penchan and Ms. Green talked about the issue of capacity development, how important capacity development is, even for understanding what is available. You know, and that has been affected in some countries in Afghanistan, for example, and in a number of countries, COVID affected capacity development in a meaningful way. But luckily for digitalization, because now of digitalization and all of these media of delivery that we can use, we can still continue with capacity development and skills training and skills upgrade. And also we talked a lot about green, green business, green business creation um, in a number of areas, in a number of countries, we've seen green businesses and green business creation and becoming much more relevant coming out of COVID-19 pandemic. As we talk about the environment and protection of the environment, you know, with the, the issue of renewable energy and green business is now coming much more important in the forefront. Um, I think South South Corporation, we argued, is critical to support inclusive, sustainable, and re resilient economy. Um, we argue that South South Corporation need to take into consideration the, the, the vulnerable among us with the poverty, the poor, and as we try to build back, back better, whatever systems, whether it's social protection systems or whatever we put in place, it needs to ensure that you know, the poverty and those less privileged are taken into consideration. And um, finally, we talked about decent work alongside, um, you know, um, business and sustainable businesses. And we all agreed that um, decent work is possible and you have to have decent work um, alongside SMEs as we go forward in the future. I think we also argued and some, you know, colleagues made the comment that we needed better coordination and harmonization of MSME policies across the region. Because in each country you go, you have different MSME policy, these different MSME laws and regulations. So if you can do a bit of harmonization as well at the South-South level, South-South Corporation level, it will go a great way in terms of support for the MSMEs. So I will stop there. And I think the rapporteur will now bring in a bit more of the you know, information that we discussed in our panel. But I think it was a very enjoyable, rich panel. And I want to thank all the panelists who, who, who presented this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sergeant. Uh, Yejin, may I invite you to take the floor then? Thank you, Oshin, and thank you, Mr. Sergeant, for all this, uh, you're sharing your insights since you have given a bit of background. Um, I will just like to emphasize that there's been three keywords cutting off from our session, which is um, scaled capacity building, uh, greening, and digitalization. And all this cross cutting sessions sectors are important. And we have learned that all our regional institutions are working hard to facilitate technical and policy support in their respective regard. But as emphasized, we need further harmonization of policies. And just to uh, kind of emphasize that um, 
Dr. Saya Yaha Akila, Deputy Secretary General from the Economic Cooperation Organization. He also emphasized that um, his institution welcomes the cooperation from other regional institutions to address the constraint that uh, ECO is facing. He also elaborated that security measures are also very important, especially uh, taking note of the current situation in Afghanistan. Uh, even if you want to provide capacity building support, how can we do when there's not much security? So these are some of the things that uh, I would like to emphasize. And hence, we need harmonized standards and policy and collective action are more important than ever. So regional cooperation are very important stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, Yejin. And finally, thank you everyone who contributed to the panel discussions. We sincerely appreciate your inputs. Mr. Nakla, may I invite you to wrap up our meeting today? Uh, it's afternoon. I was just about to say good morning, but it just hit afternoon. And so I'll not take much of your time. Uh, I just want to say about four points. I have organized quite a number of these UN days for South-South Cooperation. But I think today was kind of special. Uh, starting from the opening plenary, I sensed uh, this sense of urgency from the principal speakers on the need to use South-South Cooperation to address the very pressing problems that we're facing today which are spearheaded by the COVID-19 pandemic. And what they said about South-South cooperation is that it can help to resolve the problems because of its principles and solidarity. And so those are very important. We're not saying that South-South cooperation can solve all problems, but they're saying in a situation like this, there is a need to call upon these principles of South-South cooperation and solidarity to work together to solve the problems. So I think this was the first point. And then the second point was on the issues that they also raised, climate change and green recovery, digital transformation and recovery of the economy are key, not only for the world, but specifically for the region as well. But what uh, became obvious from the discussions I set in on uh, the breakout group three on economic uh, uh, recovery. And what I realized is that even though we can use these three as tools on their own, however, they cut across all the things. We discussed digital transformation, we discussed the green recovery in that group as well. And from the presentations that have been made by the other groups, it seems to have been the same way. And then the third point I wanted to make is a very specific requests. ESCAP in their opening said that they would like to see the intergovernmental platform uh, used um, from here onwards. And so we will be following up with ESCAP to try to see whether this can become a platform on its own or it can be integrated into the digital uh, forum, uh, regional uh, director general's forum. And so that's one very specific uh, uh, follow up that we can do. And last but not least, there was a request by several institutions for working together, particularly in harmonizing of policies, practices, and to ensure inclusion of everybody. And in particular, pertaining to inclusion, they also focused on the issues about how women are affected, particularly in the session that I set in the uh, business sector, that for the most part, they found it more difficult to access the same kind of help that is available for other uh, uh, business leaders. And so those are the four points that I wanted to mention broadly from the plenary and also taken from uh, the breakout sessions. The summaries for the breakout sessions are, are wonderful. And uh, thank you very much uh, to the moderators and uh, the, the, the rapporteurs for capturing that. Now, my next point is to tell you what we're going to do after this. We'll put together a report. I think we recorded all the sessions so working with our partner institutions, we'll put together a report 
for sharing with everybody with a particular focus on areas that can be followed through. And as I said, also, there's the issue that uh, Escap mentioned about possible platform for intergovernmental organizations. And so this will be coming to you. One request that I have is please visit the South South because you will find a lot of information. Please visit the uh, South South profiles for the region. And if you want to be um, interviewed as well, let us know. That brings me to the end of uh, uh, this event and my closing remarks, which are basically to thank all the co-organizers, uh, UNSCAP and UNDP for fully supporting us and uh, providing ideas that have resulted in has been quite a successful event. I thank you very much. I would like to thank the moderators also were very, very helpful in instructing us from our perspective of uh, being these people who talk a lot about South-South cooperation. However, when we indicated that we'd like to talk on these three areas, we had to rely on the expertise uh, from UNESCO, from ILO, and from uh, uh, um, the support that is provided uh, by JICA, um, through our friend who has worked with us in the past. And then last but not least, of course, this would not have been successful without you, the participants, who uh, listened and asked some questions and participated in the discussions. Uh, we look forward to continue interacting with you. And I'd like to thank, um, last but not least, our MC for the day. Thank you for a job well done. This brings us to the end of the day and I'll hand over back to the MC. Maybe she has a few things to say. Thank you so much. Sorry, we cannot offer you any lunch or anything, but please, wherever you are, have some lunch. Back to thank you, Shin. Thank you, Dennis. And uh, thank you all. Thank you again to everyone who joined us in celebrating the UN Day for South West Corporation. The meeting is now closed. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, everyone. How many people should be remaining? Seven. Seven. Um, I have to set this video <laughs> recording. If you want to have a meeting, can we move to another link? <laughs> because sure. it's going to take some time we, to convert. To we, we, we can use the meeting, a uh, weekly meeting link. Is that okay?
I think so, yeah. Um, yes. For me, it takes some time on my laptop to convert yes. to the videos. And maybe yeah. in five minutes so that we can go to his findings. <laughs> uh, Dennis, can we meet at 12.30? If that's okay? Oh. Or you want to meet right after this? I think he wants to meet right away. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to get it out of the way, yeah. Okay. You, we can actually stop this recording. I, I think it will be automatically saved to your desktop or uh, cloud. I try. I try uh, last time. It stopped when when we start again. It's uh -huh. So how about this? Or uh, you can uh, pause. Pause. Then I will create a new link, and you can join that link. Yeah, that that would be yeah. better. So I will yeah. call. Uh, yeah, I will send another email to all. Okay, great. Okay. Th thank you, colleagues. See you in another week. See you in a few minutes.